All right, so welcome to this talk about principles and strategies of data service automation. So a few words about myself. My name is Julian Fischer. I'm the dirty guy on the right side. Um, I'm CEO of a company called any Nines. And uh, we've been, um, we are a Cloud Foundry consultancy with focus on uh, Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes operation, as well as data service automation. So I'm trying to collect some of the experience we've collected in, uh, in the past four or five years, um, automating the life cycle of around half a dozen, a little bit more than that, data services, uh, and presenting some of the strategies here with you. Um, the first thing I would like to point out before we come to the principles themselves is that um, it is very important that when you approach um, the automation of a data service, a database, a message queue, whatever, um, that you should um, make yourself a mission because there are so many things you can automate and so many ways on how you can do that. Um, so I've seen that um, a couple of times when customers approached that topic that they ended up with a very big chaos because there were different teams um, that held the responsibility for a particular data service. And in the end, um, every data service was a little different uh, with a different operational model. So um, that in the end created a lot of effort to maintain and operate them. So mission um, is actually meant to give you motivation and strength, strength to survive setbacks and also provide a, a compass effect um, enabling autonomous decisions within your team. So I'm just giving you one of the examples. Um, your mission statement could look differently. Um, for any nines, um, we decided to strive for, the f for fully automating the entire life cycle of a wide range of data services to run on cloud native platforms across infrastructures at scale. So there are already a few constraints mentioned here that will change the way we approach the automation in the end, and that uh, that'll give us directions. So it, its main purpose is to narrow down those endless possibilities and provide us uh, a navigational means to uh, design decisions. So when we now look at those uh, principles, you will see that if you change the mission statement significantly, it may have impact on, uh, on the principles as well. Most of them, however, are quite generic, so you should be able to uh, translate them to other missions of data service automations as well. So the first and most important um, principle, it also is reflected in the title of the talk, is that we want to have uh, a mantra, which is uh, automate, automate, automate. So why is automation of data services so important? I think from the experience of consulting um, many customers on the digital uh, journey of digital transformation, we've seen that the adoption of uh, application platforms uh, usually comes with ignoring the data service topic in, in the first phase of uh, adopting to the platform. There are, there are data stores such as Oracle databases somewhere in the enterprise and and in the beginning, um, they, they, people are very busy with learning how to do agile development, how to do microservice architectures, and so on. But over time, when you realize that uh, such an application platform only works when there's a, a counterpart on the data service side that will provide you with the same user experience just for data services, what uh, a platform like Cloud Foundry provides for applications, you will see that automation is um, very important and data services need to experience the same automation as applications. So in modern application development, you're looking at microservice architectures where monolithic applications have been split into application systems. More applications exist, and subsequently, more data services exist, as the local autonomy of those teams will make decisions um, more specific to a particular service. So one service could have a relational database, the other could have a document database, and so on. So this leads to the con consequence that nowadays the applications have numerous more applications than uh, before, 
and these applications have more data services and more data service instances. So as we still aim for improving the um, overall innovation, um, the speed of innovation, we have to reduce the operational friction that comes with that increasing number of applications and data services. Therefore, automation becomes a competitive advantage um, among platforms, and um, therefore the automation of data services is also important. Referring back to the mission statement, there was uh, the statement, fully automate the entire life cycle. And um, this is what uh, the full life cycle management actually refers to. It actually comprises the challenge of automating everything a database administrator would do. And the reason why this has to be pointed out is because there are a lot of automation uh, uh, solutions out there that claim to be um, uh, data service automation solutions, but they ignore second day operations. So it's one thing to have what's, for example, a MySQL database up and running. We have done that with Chef like seven years ago. But in contrast to application containers, your databases have state. And the life cycle of a database usually is years. So you have to guide that database through very different scenarios, such as a failing uh, host underneath or um, patch level releases, minor releases, and even major releases. So if you look into the topic, what is actually the life cycle of a data service? Uh, the first thought is about what is the life cycle of a database, a data service instance in the terminology of the service broker API. Uh, it is called a service instance. At some point, you will create such a service instance. And um, this diagram is not, a, it's not exact, but it, um, it intends to express that the engineering effort of creating a service instance is not necessarily all you have to think about. Because there are other lifecycle operations, such as various possibilities to change in an existing service instance that will eat up a lot of your engineering efforts as well. So if you start uh, automate a data service, it's wise to uh, iteratively increase the depth of the automation. Start with the low-hanging fruits, those lifecycle operations that are most important and most frequently requested. So after a while, this may look like this you have covered the uh, life cycle of a data service instance, creating a data service, um, maybe clustered, maybe single versions of it. For example, with Postgres, you could have a single VM Postgres. You could have a plan with clustered Postgres, both of different sizes. You could have a, a means to go through version updates, activate or deactivate Postgres plugins, um, create backups, and restore them. So this is uh, the lifecycle automation of a service instance. It also goes, um, um, it also covers um, very essential parts of what we are talking about here. But I definitely have to point out that this is not everything. A few years back, and I've been giving talks about that topic for, uh, for four years now, uh, I would have said we are done here, but um, we've been taught otherwise. Because if you look in the, into the total uh, efforts you have to spend on that topic, you will see that there are other aspects that will consume significant time, which is the general release management, the delivering of the automation releases into the platform environments, and then, in the end, the automation of the life cycle itself. So if you look into a value chain like this, here we're using Postgres as an example, you will see that um, on the left side, there's an open source database, such as Postgres, could be MongoDB, Redis, or RabbitMQ. And whenever there is an upstream change, then we would like to have a automation release shortly after that. So with that uh, automation release, uh, you still need to ship it into the target um, environments. And uh, from there, users, platform users can use it to create service instances. And lifecycle manage means to guide that whole system, that whole delivery chain uh, through the lifecycle of uh, that particular data services. But we'll come to that a bit later. Um, back to that a bit later. Um, if, you, 
if you start automating, it's, it's kind of obvious that depending on the choice of your data service, uh, the, the efforts of automation will differ as some of the data services have been created with manual operations in mind. Postgres, for example, is such, an, um, um, is such a data service that has a lot of legacy in its DNA because it emerged in, um, in a time where um, automated data service operation was not a thing. So subsequently, it's a little bit more complicated to automate than services such as Elasticsearch, which are inherently a bit more um, modern and, and maybe also because of its nature, easier to um, operate and therefore easier to automate. So let's uh, say that there are decision factors you should be investigating when uh, collecting uh, candidates for your platform. And they are numerous. This list is far from being complete, but it demonstrates the complexity of such a decision. And uh, in most of the cases, you will also look at legacy use cases, application that will demand that you automate for legacy services. Postgres is a good example, as every platform needs a relational database management system. You are looking into Postgres and MySQL for sure. Um, you will have, and this leads us to the data service categories, you will have to cover the document database, the caches, key value store, message queues, and so on. So in, in all these uh, services will differ on how robust they are, whether they are clusterable, or how they, how they handle replication, and so on. So once you've picked your uh, data services, um, it, it, it somehow determines how much effort you will spend on automation. Um, from experience, I can tell you that there's a vast difference between one and the other uh, end of the spectrum. Um, I also believe that over time, data services will be easier to automate, as, as this will also have a certain impact on the design of data service in the long run. You can see that with Postgres, which has recently introduced client-side failover, uh, a big step makes making automation easier, for example. Another principle when automating data service is that you should design for scale. And the reason for that is because um, platforms such as Cloud Foundry, they require a certain scale to be economically viable. So when doing platform um, consulting, we've seen that most of the organizations we've been talking to, they've made multi-million investments into building such a platform because it's just very much effort to move a group of people to adapt to such a new thing and change the way they develop software and so on. So in an organization, it's very expensive to do that. So after a while, a platform that's economic or viable has hundreds, if not thousands or ten thousands of applications. Otherwise, it's just a very, very expensive hobby. And uh, for that reason, the data service automation should keep up that standard. So whatever there is, uh, whatever Cloud Foundry is for applications, the solution we are looking for is for data services. Now it's a fact that if you want to do something at scale, that changes the optimal technical solution for it. And um, as I've been doing software development for quite a while, and while this seems to be obvious, um, people tend to ignore that this is the case for software too. So I prepare that, uh, that little funny comparison so we have three different technical solutions to do one thing, which is barbecue sausages. So it's just the scale that differs. Uh, see, the left and the right one, uh, they, they just are different. In the scale, they do the same thing. And it's pretty much the same for your data service automation. So when I talk about uh, the scale of a platform, um, then we are talking about thousands or 10,000s of data service instances. So if your automation uh, would not um, allow you to do that, then you should maybe rethink your mission statement because this is basically what a platform is designed to do for applications. So most likely you will need that for data service as well. Um, but the number of service instances is a particular bad metric to uh, describe the scale of a solution because if you think back into that value chain we've just seen, there are many influencing factors such as the frequency an application writes and reads from a data service instance, uh, the amount of data written to it, 
the number of uh, service instances coexisting, the data service types being available, the number of, of environments you're deploying to, um, and the number of infrastructures you're deploying to. So we can simplify that and say, well, there are certain categories of scale. And the most important one, ones are the ones that describe the service instances itself, the one that describe the service broker and its automation, as well as the release management and delivery. So if you look back into, uh, into that uh, diagram where the entire value chain is shown, that uh, one of the aspects is in, in a platform, you'd, at any time, a user should have the possibility to on-demand self-service. So if you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and you want to create a Postgres database, there you go. Um, the dominant pattern to do that is today the on-demand provisioning of dedicated service instances where such a service instance would be represented by a virtual machine, a container, or a set of virtual machines or containers, as this guarantees a horizontal scalability um, in contrast to shared clusters where you have a fixed set of virtual machines which you will then slice up into service instances. The on-demand provisioning scales until the boundaries of your infrastructure, but it's not architecturally limited to the number of service instances. Obviously, when talking about uh, cloud uh, solutions, you also want the vertical scalability. Um, so you can stop an application and just create a bigger instance of it. And the same you want to do with uh, your data of the database, but with the difference that then you'll have to keep uh, ensure yet that you have to ensure that the data is still there after you're scaling this up and you want to minimize the downtime. So this is about service instance scalability. Now, if you provide a platform to your user and uh, you've seen the impact of the NoSQL movement over the year is that more database types become more popular. And while uh, splitting down the application from a monolith to more microservice-based architectures, more applications will have um, or will put the choice of particular specialized data services upon local teams so that it is likely that your users will demand more and more data services over time as they may specifically so solve a certain kind of problems very well. So this also requires that when you automate data services, you have to ensure that you can automate a larger set of data services efficiently and once you've got those automation releases, you have to ensure that you ship those into the customer environment. And just to give you an understanding, uh, for example, we deliver data services in, to many uh, different organizations. Each customer has its very own 300-page handbook on, on security. So this delivery pipeline is highly customer-specific and uh, includes pen test and security tests uh, vulnerability scans and so on that are highly customer specific. So while this has to be part of your delivery pipeline, so a customer expects us to give him something, you still have to be very quick in adjusting that to the customer needs and keep up the pace so that this delivery pipeline does not slow down the delivery cadence of your overall solution. So that's what I'm saying is you have to get your release management right because delivering fast is very important. So look at that scenario. In the past, there was a DBA who has access to the upstream source code of, for example, Postgres and would be able to apply a patch uh, to a database. Now, we create a Postgres automation release and ship it to the customer environment and, own, and then it is up to the platform user to update that service instance. So we have three things to do. The first of all is the automation release should be available shortly after the upstream change. And in our case, for example, this is done entirely automatic, uh, automatically. That means that, for example, if Postgres 9.4.1, um, 9.4.2 is released, uh, a few minutes later, we have an automation release that will trigger the execution of a comprehensive test suite to ensure that the contract between the data service and our automation is still valid and intact. So then you have to ship that to the customer as fast as you can, minimizing that time 
requires to have a framework here, a template for such a delivery pipeline, but then and, uh, somehow customize it with the specifics of a certain customer. And even one customer usually has half a dozen or more of those Cloud Foundry environments, for example, so uh, that this is already um, a matter of scalability. So you have to be quick with that. And obviously now the platform users are, uh, have to update their service instances. So once you have installed the new version of, of Postgres with your new automation into the uh, cloud environment, then you still have hundreds of those database instances being locally held by different maybe customers of the customer and, uh, and need to be encouraged to update their service instances and to do that fast because you want to deliver security patches fast, right? And to minimize that time, you have to provide your users means to do that easily. So for example, just uh, perform a CF update service and the update will take, uh, uh, will take place automatically. Now, one of the other strategies um, is, um, it's basically something that's very essential to any cloud operations, is the approach to rebuild things instead of fixing it. Um, this is not new. For example, the Linux kernel in the early days had a lot of code about failure recovery, and uh, some developers said, why, why don't we just take out that that entire code, which saves us about 50% of the code base, and just throw a kernel pa panic and uh, shout down the hole that somebody needs to restart that server. And uh, if you're running Linux today, you will see kernel panic, so it's kind of a strategy that works today as well. Coming back to data service, it's not as easy. So while Cloud Foundry will just restart your application somewhere in the cluster when an instance dies, um, that's not as easy with your uh, data service because you have state, and that state needs to be stored somewhere. So one of the most, the more uh, essential strategies in, in, in cloud operation today is to separate the life cycle of the ephemeral virtual machine where your database is running from the persistent disk where the database stores the data. And that is meaningful because the machine where your database is being executed is a cheap off-the-shelf server or at least it's not a high-end server anymore, where the storage server is very specific, uh, surely has hardware redundancies to a certain degree, and has a very different service level than the and availability as the host machine where your database runs. So if you look into that virtual machine that contains your database, um, and now the virtual machine goes away, your persistent disk prevails. It can be a gracefully unmounted and a new virtual machine can be created where you remount that persistent disk and there you go. This is something that happens, uh, we are using Bosch to automate the creation of service instances, and this is something that happens um, within minutes. If you're using Kubernetes, uh, the restart of a container is even faster, so this can happen within seconds. Be aware, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't place your workloads uh, of your data services on a Kubernetes cluster, uh, we are currently investigating uh, uh, deploying data services to Kubernetes, but we wouldn't recommend using that until Kubernetes has solved the I.O. Uh, isolation issue that it currently has. So you couldn't ensure that two database nodes, be, uh, two database instances being co-located on the same um, uh, Kubernetes node wouldn't affect each other's I.O. performance, which is something that is very relevant for a database. So now all the automation is very interesting and it's very nice. So we've been through that creation of the database and so on. But look, now you've created, they have the possibility to create a thousand Postgres clusters, MongoDB clusters, RabbitMQ clusters, uh, just like that. Imagine you have hundreds of customers who, who, who are using that and, and your infrastructure has a hiccup and uh, or for some other reasons, a larger number of clusters fail simultaneously. You still need to ensure this uh, on-demand self service. So how can you do that? For example, RabbitMQ, uh, if, you, if you use RabbitMQ uh, wrongly, you can easily, easily kill such a cluster. So how would you recover? Depending on the data service, um, it will always be important that you'll have such a recovery 
um, um, and, um, as a last resort. So if you want to automate data service, you have to get your backup strategy right. And going back to the mission statement where you want to create uh, the automation of a larger sum of data services, you have to ensure that you'll find a way to deal with the heterogeneity as the backup procedure of different data services can be vastly different. So by providing a unified backup API, you can actually abstract from this heterogeneity at some point and then settle on uh, more generic um, resolution uh, logic, for example, recovering data service instances, which makes the existence of such a backup framework, for example, necessary where you have data service specific plugins and also uh, storage specific plugins on the right side and in between a filter chain that does compression and encryption. Now, it's a pretty interesting time because we have Cloud Foundry on the one hand that uh, allows us to uh, create uh, applications. We have underneath Bosch that can also be used to provision data services. And at the same time, we see Kubernetes becoming more and more popular. And I would make a bet that at some point that isolation problem will go away and Kubernetes will be a fair choice to use for data service automation. So we should be prepared to uh, ship into different automation formats, including Bosch releases, PCF tiles, and Kubernetes Helm charts, for example. And this is more a rhetorical question, because at this point, you have to somehow organize uh, the answer to that question. What is actually shared across the automation of PCF tiles and Kubernetes Helm charts? And the answer is your operational model. Because once you solved the uh, magic around organizing a Postgres cluster, its cluster management, its failover, uh, its leader election, and, and uh, the propagation of a new master node, this logic will basically be the same because the underlying principles are the same. So whether you're restarting a, a container or, you're, or a VM will be pretty much the same thing. And I, I, I bet you could use the same test suite as long as you abstract the actual deployment. Um, so yeah, um, this should be done whenever you automate that you should, um, well, we use open source databases and because we believe that this is an open standard between the application and, and, the, um, uh, and the database and you can get it from everywhere, so preventing a login. Um, the automation language, so the language you as a platform user talk to trigger the creation of a database should be an open standard uh, as well, and the Open Service Broker API does a really good job here. So this avoids a vendor login. As long as you have a Postgres on the left side and uh, the Open Service Broker on the right side, you can exchange the automation in the middle. Looking at this um, very um, at this mission of having a broader set of data services, one of the things that uh, ensures a fast release cadence is to never touch the upstream source code with the exception of temporary hotfixes that, are, that have to be monitored as long as they applied. Um, you wouldn't do that in the long term because then the release cadence becomes slower because you still have to maintain the manual uh, harmonization between your patch and upstream changes. So that's why the only true way on, on changing the source code would be to have a pull request against the uh, upstream source code. Another strategy, and this is a major one, is uh, that you should solve any issue on the framework level if, if possible. You shouldn't approach the automation of a broader set of data service without having a framework that contains solutions to most common uh, issues. So for example, on-demand provisioning of dedicated instances is something that we've put into a framework. So whenever we uh, automate a new service, we can rely on that functionality. And all we have to do is create a Bosch release and a component that manages credentials, as well as a backup and restore plugin. That boils down the creation of new services to around four to eight weeks, uh, which, is, which is a, pr a pretty nice uh, uh, thing to have. And the reason why this is possible, because we always think about any problem we have, is is this a framework level problem or, or a data service specific problem? So only if that cannot be solved on a, on a framework level or we have great benefit to solve a data service specifically, this is what we do. So one of the, pro one of the issues that you could, for example, uh, solve at the, at the framework level is that you should, you should protect 
your data service instances against such a trivial thing like, like the disk is full. And you would be surprised how many data services respond to that event with horrific failure and data loss. So a parachute mechanism, for example, that prevents that is one of the things you can easily build for all data services and then reapply it. So obviously, we've seen that uh, the release cadence among the entire value chain is very important to us. So without uh, release tests, you, how would you deal with the uncertainties of those upstream changes? How would you detect that the contract is broken between the Postgres version uh, you just recently had, the new one, and your automation release? For example, as trivial things as a, a, a configuration parameter that has changed or a default value that has been introduced that will change something about uh, your assumption, uh, especially when dealing with clusters, there's a lot of complexity. So you should be able to test those things and should provide a comprehensive test suite walking through each release through the life cycle of such a database. So, for example, we excessively test uh, the reintegration of a failed master in Postgres, just to give you one example. This gives you the confidence that a new upstream automation release that has been created by you will be uh, uh, working when you deliver it. More than that, you should also take whatever you've been writing to the runbooks in the past years and, and add it to your test suite so that a failure never occurs twice. So uh, this talk has been at least three times as long, so I, I had to narrow it down. I will also release um, a, a blog post series around that topic with a longer video version of that talk. So if you want to dig uh, deeper into that topic, uh, just uh, go by the Any9s blog and you'll find more to that. To um, just reiterate, I, I strongly believe that if you change that mission statement, for example, and replace that uh, idea of having a lot of data service to be automated with just one. That also has a lot of impact on the principles. So setting your mission um, in, in conjunction to your uh, platform strategy is very important. It leads to some principles that should be known to all your team members and enables local autonomous decisions if you split your automation team into smaller groups. The automation is very important and should rely on a framework that has a lot of those common issues across data service worked into it. And as you see, there are technological and strategic shifts that make agnosticism important, where you try to abstract. So, so for example, by using technology such as Bosch, you can protect against, uh, uh, or you can be flexible and deploy to different infrastructures. With the Open Service Broker API, you can support multiple platforms, and so on. So you try to uh, keep your investment safe by committing to the right things. So I hope you gain something for your particular data service mission. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We have a booth. Uh, shoot any questions. If uh, come by and ask me any question, or just tweet me or send me a mail. If there are any questions left, just feel free to ask. I think we have a few minutes left. All right, then thank you very much.